afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Lee Robinson, and on behalf of the Lutheran Library, I would like to welcome you here today. Uh, I am supervising this branch, and we have been very, very excited today, uh, or sorry, recently about today's guest. I just have a couple of housekeeping things to mention before we begin today's presentation. Just a reminder that smoking is not allowed on this property, uh, but you are more than welcome to stand on the sidewalk by the road if you feel the need for a cigarette. Also, the fire exits are the doors in which you enter, and also there's a second door at the rear of the room on the right, on your right hand side. Uh, there are refreshments available at the back for your enjoyment, and they are compliments of the Prince George Retirement Residence and the Lupin Area Heritage Committee. So thank you for both of those, to both of those groups uh, for sponsoring today's event. And speaking of which, I would also like to mention that the Lucan Area Heritage and Donley Museum is now open for their 2016 season. They have some amazingly interesting exhibits and collections, so please take the time to, to uh, have a look at this gem in our community. All right. The presentation today considers the possibility that an individual named in the publication a viable suspect is responsible for a number of unsolved murders of young women in Ontario, including the murder of 12-year-old Lynn Harper near the Clinton Air Force Base in 1959. The author, Barry Rule, was a member of the OPP for 30 years and following his retirement in 1994, became the eviction counselor for the OPP, assisting police officers and their families with substance abuse issues. He has a degree in sociology from the University of Waterloo and a social work degree from York University. He is married to Pat, which is a and they have a son, Jeffrey, who is teaching at Carleton University. Barry is currently completing a second book entitled Booze and the Badge. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming uh, Sergeant Retired Barry Rule. Paul Farrell was now passed, Paul was on Carter and Sava Beach. 
And we waited, and we waited, and there was nothing going on until about 3 o'clock. Suddenly out of the shadows came this person walking towards us, carrying a pole, a long pole. When he got close, I said, hit him with the lights, Paul. And Paul turned the lights on, and there was Larry Talbot. Deer caught, the, and he takes off into the bush. And we chase him. We're not fast enough. But he throws the pole down. What do you think that pole was? Somebody's read the books, probably. Anybody know? Yeah? What did you think of the book? Yes, it was a mop handle. What a wonderful way of doing it. You know, the cottage culture and what happens at cottages in the summer, it's hot, people have a few drinks, lay in the sun all day, barbecue, leave the windows open. Larry Talbot had been there forever, so he had the culture. He understood the culture of the beach. So what better way to go along in the middle of the night and take that mop handle and pull it out, see who's in there, take the money and put it back in. Well, <clears throat> we kept our windows tight, and Pat and I, we weren't married yet, but we were going to be married. And uh, I was staying at the Kitlock Motel, and Pat had a little cottage up from the hotel. So one night, our friend, uh, Ron Love, he was entertaining us with his guitar. What was the name of that song, Pat? Uh, Looking Out My Back Door. Right. right. Well, we had some steaks, a little bit of wine, and we decided we were tired, we were going to go to bed fairly early. That night, we were involved in the most uh, horrendous crime that ever was committed at Salvo Beach, I think, or one of the most. And I want to share with you now what happened. woke me out of a deep sleep. My first groggy and irritable thought was that some of the other cops were playing a prank on us. But as I stumbled out of bed stark naked towards the bedroom wall light switch, I almost bumped into a dark figure in the doorway, a man in a garish orange mask holding a flashlight pointing a gun at my face. This was no joke and this wasn't one of my cop pals. What's up, buddy? I asked cautiously. There was silence as the armed intruder stared at us and slowly walked back into the living room. Then he uttered a terrifying command, get the bride out of here. Leave her out of this, I replied. Suddenly Pat appeared wearing a short, slinky nightgown. In a gruff voice, the intruder ordered her, raise it. Pat, in a timid, almost inaudible voice, replied, I don't think so. He pointed the menacing gun and lifted her, I'll shoot. Tremblingly, she slowly raised it. The intruder lifted and lowered the gun in an unspoken command in order to make her move faster. And as she raised the gown, he was thrusting his hips as if he was having sex. Come on, come on, that's it, that's it. Suddenly he stopped and ordered Pat to get my wallet. The wallet was an OPP. I had an OPP wallet made. This is it here. You can see the insignia on it? Yeah. So I didn't want him to see it. stopped and ordered Pat to get the wallet. She retreated from the mantle and was walking towards him when I grabbed it threw it on the floor. By now he was standing at the rear door and ordered me to pick it up. No, I said. He pointed the gun at me, pick it up or I'll shoot. I don't think it will, I replied. I was 240 pounds back then. Okay? Reasonably wild guy, usually. Usually. I don't think you will, I replied. He stared at me for a second, then bolted from the cottage, grabbing Pat's purse as he fled. I went after him, chasing him down along King Edward Drive. It must have been a surreal spectacle for any fortunate, <laughs> unfortunate enough to have witnessed it. A masked man being pursued by a naked man. Now you can just picture this as you're out having a breath of fresh air at 3 o'clock in the morning, and you're kind of looking around, and all of a sudden, by you goes a guy with a gun, and you look around, and there's a naked guy chasing him. Right? You're going, Am I, am I seeing things? So, get back, he yelled. Suddenly he turned and fired a shot, hitting me in the chest, but not stopping me. I managed to grab the back of his coat, and he swung around and struck me several times with a gun. I was injured, but managed to wrestle him to the ground. I got on top of him, and, attempted to, and he attempted to get up, but I pummeled him until he surrendered. I hit him a few times. 
Leave me go. Let me go. Don't call the cops, he pleaded. I removed the mask and immediately recognized him. I am a cop, Talbot, and you're under arrest. He was carrying four sets of hockey laces. Listen to this. Four sets of hockey laces, a skeleton key, a sharp hunting knife, elements of what we would call a rape kit. His car was parked 0.3 kilometers from our cottage in front of a place that was for sale. And the keys were up in the wheel well. So he was charged with armed robbery, break and enter with intent, and uh, assault occasioning bodily harm. Now, I have a book here, whether you read it or not. Who can tell me what he got in terms of the sentence? Whoever gets it, the answer gets a book. Or the closest. The closest to it. Come on, folks. Nothing? 30 days. 30 days. Six months. Six months. 60. 60. 60 days. 24 hours. Getting close. 12 hours. Two, two days. Overnight. Nothing. Who said reprimand? Alright, you're getting close. That's getting fairly close. Anybody else? 18. Warning. Reprimanded. No. Probation. Okay. Right home. That's a good one too. All right.
engagement picture. Thank you, man. That's our engagement picture. He was going after her. He had a cottage about seven down or ten down from us. My guess is through the week, I come back from Spain, he's wandering around the beach because this is what he did. He could have even been peeking in on her through the night. We don't know. But that's what he was going after, and that's what he was going to use to tie her up. And I, I say this in all sincerity, she probably wouldn't be here today if I had to stop. No question in my mind. Next. Organized criminal. This is his car, 0.3 kilometers away. There's the keys. He doesn't want to lose his keys, see? He's been thinking. He's a traveling salesman. What did this guy do? Well, he sold a few things and stopped a few places. But this is what I think he did all day. What would be a great match? Oh, this one of these uh, rings, butcher cord, whatever. This is what he's doing. In September of 1973, I got a call from the Oakville Police Department, an officer. He told me that Larry Talbot was the prime suspect in the murder of a girl by the name of Pauline Ivy Dudley. Pauline Ivy Dudley. She was 17 years old. She left her mother's place in Oakville and she was hitchhiking. There was a police officer that was patrolling in Henderson Park, about six miles away from there, north of there. And he saw a car. It was backed into a bush area. No one was around the car. So what he did was he took down the license plate. And he left. Two weeks later, they found her body a mile away. In a field, laying like this, lying like this. A few bushes on her. So this officer went to the detective and he said, you might want to look at this guy. I got his license plate. Here it is. So they went to see Larry Talbot, living 15 minutes away in Burlington. 15 minutes away. Can we look in your car? Yeah, go ahead. So they look in his car. Behind the headrest, there's a splotch of blood. More importantly, on the floor of that car, in the back seat, there's a clump of hair. That hair was tested at the Center of Forensic Sciences. That hair was similar to Pauline Ivy Dudley. There was one that was typical of forced removal on the side, molding, forced removal. So they went to his trunk, they found a wooden dildo, desensitizing cream, a knife, brown sheets, two used flashlights, and then he had a short sleeve shirt, and in the pocket there was surgical gloves in the pocket. So he submitted the three polygraphs, and guess what? He failed all three. Screw you guys, I'll get my own polygraph operator. You're all full of it, right? Narcissistic to a, a fault, somewhat like Trump. Not quite so, so much so. <laughs> anyway, I wasn't investigating. He called me, we were having a nice time then. He called me, and uh, I just let it go. I said, well, good luck, whatever you're doing. 1981, I was promoted, and I went to Barry, second in charge of the crime unit, which was policing from Shelburne to Huntsville, overseeing the major crime and things like that. I got called to a sexual assault investigation at Osega Beach. A 10-year-old girl was sleeping with her grandmother in a cottage, and in the middle of the night, a guy walked in, and he took her out. He tied her hands, took her to his car, and he sexually assaulted her. 10 years old. So I went over and I'm looking around the cottage, you know, what's going on here? And there by the door, the door is open and there's a block of wood holding that door open. At our cottage at the break-in, there was a pail holding the door open. Why? Quick exit. You don't have to do this, you don't have to, now you're gone. And I thought, my God, could it be him? Could it be him? So. I called over to my buddy Doug Murray at Sobel Beach, and I said, Doug, Larry Talbot, is he still around? Oh yeah, he said, coincidentally, a couple of nights ago, I chased him through the bush. He discarded a pair of leather, leather gloves he had, and he had two knives on him, and he said, oh, you caught me, I was stealing lawn chairs. Oh, really? 
Yeah, he was probably cruising for the same thing, same kind of uh, business. So I thought, I'm going to call that guy from the Oakville Police Department and just see what's going on with this guy. So I called and I talked to the same officer that had talked to me in, uh, in 71. And I said, Larry Talbot, is he still on your hit list for that uh, Dudley homicide? He says, oh yeah. He says, he's the prime suspect. He's nobody else. We just can't get him. We just can't get him. You heard the evidence of what we, they had. We just can't get him. So I said to him, send me the, uh, all your reports. I want to have a look at them. So he did. I had an epiphany. Here's a traveling salesman. Travels all over Ontario. What better occupation than a traveling salesman if you're a killer or if you want to do these kind of things? You're in Salvo Beach one day, as I found out. He's in Kingston the same day. You commit a crime here. 100 miles away within hours. No supervision on this guy. He does what he wants. And it really bothered me. And I'd go for runs, and I kept thinking about this guy. I thought, if he killed Dudley, and there's a good possibility he did, is he killing others? Is this just a one-time shot? He was sexually motivated, so no, this probably isn't. So I got a hold of the brass, and I said, we should go on surveillance. We should, we should go on this guy. Well, they didn't have enough manpower. That's what they told me. However, in 1982, there was two homicides that got my attention. The one was Christine Prince, an English nanny. Anybody remember English, Christine Prince? Christine Prince left the show in downtown Toronto, and she was walking home, and all they found was an umbrella on Parkdale, near where she lived. Her body was found 30 kilometers away, 30 kilometers away in the Scarborough area. Sewell's Road and Rouge River. Hi, come on in. Join the party. Welcome to Walmart. Her body's found Sewell's Creek. I'm Sewell's Road, Rouge River. And she's been sexually assaulted. And the police said that whoever did this, in terms of the place, the location, had to know where it was. It was so secluded. So secluded. So I wondered at the time where Larry Talbot was living, and I found out he was living in Scarborough. I went to his residence, and from his residence to where that crime happened, it was seven kilometers away. It took me nine minutes and three lights I stopped for. Three lights, think about that. Comfort zone. Comfort zone. He knows the area. He knows this area. Back of his hand. Did you commit the crime? You know? I minutes you're home. In September, Delia Adriano went missing. Delia Adriano was from Oakville. Her boyfriend dropped her off at home, and she's gone. They find her body in November, 30 kilometers away. She's been sexually assaulted, left in a lover's lane. Well, can I can I can I hook all to this? So I went down to where Talbot worked, used to be where she worked, two kilometers away. Toronto, two kilometers away. Maybe a coincidence, right? Maybe a coincidence. I'm okay with that. I was doing an intelligence report at this time because I felt I had enough now. The cornerstone was Dudley. No question about it. That's the cornerstone. Build it up from there. So I did. Less church, ironically, represented or went before the courts as a character witness for, for Talbot on our crime and another. But he'd given up on him because he just kept doing bad things. Les was a religious person, a nice fellow. So I went up and I talked to Les and I said, Les, I'm doing a report on Larry Talbot. What can you tell me about him? Like, do you know anything about where you traveled and that? Les took over in 1960, 1960, so Talbot had it, 1959, something to remember, 1960 he took over. So I said, here's a map, I said, I want you to draw circles around all the places. So he drew King Carden, Godridge, 
Tinsel, Mitchell, Collingwood, Clinton. Right away. Clinton. Why Clinton? Oh, we do the odd, uh, we have the odd sales there. Clinton Air Force Base. I said, where did you get your information from? Was it from him? He says, no, no, the company. The company's been doing it since 1951. Talbot's been with that company since 1951 to 1959. So I said to him, do you know what kind of car he would be driving? He says, no, but there's another guy that knows cars and he'd be able to tell you. I said, okay. Well, long story short, and Talbot told us in 2000, he was driving a 1957 Chevy Bel Air 210. Robin A. Blue with a green top. Okay. So this is the map. There's the circles. That's the actual map. Here's Talbot. And the reason I did that was because of his family and his grandchildren and everybody else. He was nothing but... Uh, he was just not a, he was just an awful person. But his family didn't have to suffer, or the grandkids, because he had the kind of a name that would stick right out. So I did that. I didn't have to, because when he died, I could do anything I wanted with him. He's dead. The only person that could sue me then would be, be him. And he won't be able to come out of hell to do anything. Right? There's the car, 1957 Chevy Bel Air. Lots of chrome. Bel Air, lots of chrome, right? Bel Air, lots of chrome. Turquoise blue. Let's remember that. Okay. Ben Harper. Holly Knight and Dudley. If you watch Pat's picture and Dudley's, do they look alike? Yes, because serial killers or those types, they're looking for a certain, if they can get one. That's their image. That's their fantasy. They live in a fantasy world. They build on fantasies. But that's what's his, in my opinion. Christine Prince, the English nanny, and Delia Adriana. He heard it. 
He went to Toronto complaining about it. Well, they sent him to Barry to complain. And that's all he did. Oh, you're picking on me. My wife is in the car. We're having marital problems. Yada, yada. Nothing else. He didn't do anything. He didn't get a lawyer. He didn't go to the press. Nothing. Well, I went downstairs because the OPP had lost confidence in me. They spent all this money on this guy, and this is what happened. So there was nothing I could do. So I go downstairs, running up a uh, uniform group of guys. They used to call me Dad. The brass weren't around. And we had a great time. I went out the road, back, back in the road. It took a while because I hadn't been doing it. I had been doing a lot of surveillance and undercover work. But I got back at it. One day, I'm reading the newspaper, this one here. I gotta tell you, these are two reporters, and I don't have their names up there, I forget their names. But they, in their own, not talking to me or anything else, they put this package together. This package here, and guess what? Christine Prince, Delia Adriano, Cindy Holliday on the far right. This was 10 years after they let him go. You see, once he, we got the burn, that's what he found out about us, and I went downstairs, they dropped it. There was no more done. Everything was done. They didn't heat him up, they didn't bring him in, they didn't question him, nothing. He was just free to go. 10 years later, Cindy Holliday was hitchhiking outside of Midhurst, where we used to live. Her body was found 10 kilometers away in a forestration area, in Horseshoe Valley. Which Talbot used to travel when he was going to Gravenhurst because he got a ticket in that same area. So, I put together an intelligence report. I thought, the hell with it. I'm going to put in another report. So I did. And I basically put in what you, you folks have seen here. And I said, he should be surveilled. I mean, this guy is maybe a loose cannon, right? I never heard anything. But I'm out mowing my lawn one day. And my neighbor come over, this is surreal, and he said, oh, I was at a party the other night, and this chief superintendent, I can't quite forget his name, but he said, tell Barry, we're investigating Talbot. I only have a couple years for, before I retire, and we're going to try and get him. We've had two women out hitchhiking, trying to see if he picked them up, and they, he didn't. I said, I think they're probably police women, probably with a tape on them, recorder. These guys don't operate that way. They don't all of a sudden, oh, it's, there's got to be some variables. Stress, bad day, bad move, party, who knows? But he didn't pick them up. So nothing else was done. I didn't hear anything else, and I surmised nothing else happened. In 1994, I retired. And I had finished my degree in New York. And I began working with a psychologist at uh, headquarters in, uh, in uh, Aurelia. And we go up, we do police shootings and uh, accidents, and I, I help with that stuff, and substance abuse officers in trouble with booze and that. And I'm reading in the newspaper, 1997, November, that Truscott will take a DNA, that he will submit to a DNA, and I'm reading this going, you know what? That's the dumbest thing you're gonna do if you did that, because they're gonna know. DNA is a slam dunk. So I thought, the hell, I'm going to put in another report. So I did, a 69-page report to the OPP. But in this one, I was now retired, so they couldn't get my pension. And I put it in, and I said, this report considers the possibility that Larry Talbot is the prime suspect in the homicide of Lynn Harper and other women in Ontario. And then I went and I ran through it. This was, this was, it. This was in the book. And it was part, uh, part of the report. Now, all this vehicle. At the time that Stephen Truscott was driving Lynn Harper down to the bridge, down to the road, he came back to the bridge, and he saw her get into, quoting Hobbs, Constable Hobbs, a late model Chevrolet with lots of chrome. Lots of chrome, folks. Gray in color. Well, 
If the sun's beaming down on a Chevrolet, six o'clock at night, this is Ramonet Blue. You got artists in the uh, audience? What color do you think it would be? Gray. Gray, thank you. Gray. Every audience has said the same thing. And I got that information from two artists. One was with the OPP, and the other was a friend that worked at Georgian College, a teacher. Gray. Clinton Air Force Base customer, there's no question, no question that he visited the Clinton Air Force Base. Well, if you can do that, you're going to know the whole area. You're going to know the whole area, and you, there's a reason to be there, right? Reason to be there. And he had Sifto Salt as a customer. Sifto Salt, right? Mitchell, four highway, eight highway. Blood Group A. Lynn Harper was found in a kind of an alcove in the, in the woods, as we know, Mossman's Bush, like this, arm like that. Blood on her and around her. Labordet, Isabel Labordet, in the, in the 1966 writing, she did a wonderful job on this. But that was part of what she said. Well, how does that relate to Larry Talbot? You know, what's his name? Larry Talbot's group A. Well, why would he be cut? He'd be cut because in the dark, with someone struggling, if they were, and you've got a sharp knife and you're trying to cut this blouse to bring it around her neck, you could have nicked yourself. And that could have been some of his blood. Speculation. But that's what you do when you're a cop. Investigate. You can put them all together. Shoe imprints, 10 to 11 inches. At the scene where Harker was lying, there were pushback marks. Six inches below her. Like this. Shoes that are like that. Not like this, like this. They measured 10 to 11 inches. In 1978, when he was running through the bush at another uh, scene very similar to ours, they arrested him and they grabbed his shoes. Size 9. 9 relates to 11 inches. 11 inches. 5 foot 10, 5 foot 3. So it's not quite a slam dunk. That's 7. We're saying 6 inches, but it's close. And, you know, we don't know, but you put it in there. The reef knot. Who knows how to do a reef knot? Who does reef knots? Boy <laughs> Larry Talbot, I went through his personal file at his company. I got a lot of good information. He was a Boy Scout. He was a Boy Scout. Whoever did this in the dark had to be very skilled. Doing all this stuff. Crime scene neatness. Now this is an interesting piece. Labordet and Julian Shear in his uh, wonderful book on this talks about the neatness of the crime scene, how neat it was. She wasn't thrown anywhere. She was lying, laying down, kind of like this. Shoes next to the body. Socks rolled up. Socks rolled up, and the zipper on her shorts was pulled up, set down. Three branches, and this was the big mystery, the three branches over top of it. The neat crime scene, same as Dudley, neat crime scene, almost the same. Larry Talbot was a neat freak, an absolute neat freak. 1976, 75, somewhere in that neighborhood. Cottager came home to Sable Beach to his cottage in the morning, and he walked in, and there's Larry Talbot lying on his bed, wearing gloves, leather gloves, and carrying a knife in his belt. What are you doing here? Oh, I must have got to the wrong place. I was at a party last night, and I have an aspirin I want to get going. Cool, smooth, cold. So he gave him an aspirin, and that was Talbot's mistake. Why? Come on. Neat free. Smash the glass to get in. Swept it up. Put it away. Took a turkey out of the fridge. Put it in the sink. 
put a towel on the bed when he went to bed. His trunk, compared to ours, was absolutely spotless. I keep a good trunk, Pat doesn't. His trunk was spotless. Everything was in place. His way he dressed, everything about him. I want to read you something, and it's not very real. His two psychologists, and this is their business, they do the serial killing, things like that. Profiling violent crimes, Holmes and Holmes. They've done a number of books on this, criminologists. Obsessive compulsive, compulsive behavior and a personality type referred to as an organized non-social offender. He has an organized personality that is reflected in his lifestyle, home, vehicle, and personal appearance. This kind of offender may be called an anal. All right, thank you. Anal personality type. In his life, there's a place for everything, and everything must be in its place. Now, please don't think, oh, that sounds like me. <laughs> We're talking about a very dark, deep, and I'm not even going to call him sick, I won't give him that, but a very deviant individual. I don't think I have to say much about the violence in the bit. I think you get it, right? He was a violent individual. When he hit me with that gun, I got thinking, I always thought about this. I, I, I follow this every day. Every day I, I think about it. When he hit me with that gun, I thought if a woman was hit with that gun that way, she'd be gone. Knew what he was doing with it. Like that. Pauline and Dudley and Lynn Harbour, a similar MO, uh, offer a MO, let's say. Now, during the Coffin Inquiry, prior to it, everyone knows the Coffin Inquiry, this is when Truscott, they wanted, Lochner was his lawyer, and they wanted to have this inquiry to, to, to have everything out there in terms of freeing him up for this wrongful conviction uh, or getting him a new trial. And I'm reading this, I'm going to Pat. We should, we should see Lockyer, because I've got a lot of information here that might be helpful. And uh, my other thought was, well, public trust, I'm a cop. <coughs> Can I say things that I've got within the organization and not be charged for, for breaching public trust, right? So Edward Greenspan, God bless him, he's passed, but he saw us at his bank. He had a little bank on King Street. Everyone knows Eddie Greenspan or knows of him? Yeah. One of the top, top criminal lawyers ever can on the scene. Very great. Did scales of justice, in fact, where Truscott, where this was in there, in that book as well. So we went in to see him. He spent two and a half, three hours with us, sitting behind his desk, with us, all dressed up to the nine. Five cigars in the tray, partly <coughs> smoking. Eyes like this as I talk, I think it's a sleeper. So he said to us, leave this with me. He said, it could be a public trust issue. He said, leave it with me, I'll get back to you. Eddie Greenspan, folks. He read that report, the report that the OPP got. Todd White, his, his partner, called me and he said, Larry Talbot, there's a strong circumstantial case against Larry Talbot for the murder of Lynn Harbour. That's what Eddie Greenspan said. Not Barry Rule, not anybody else. Eddie Greenspan, smart man, Todd White, smart man. Lawyers. Next part. This is extremely important. This is extremely important. When my report went in, and they were looking at investigating him, the report went to what they called the Behavioral Sciences Unit at the OPP. The Behavioral Sciences Unit do a lot of a number of things in terms of comparative analysis of crimes. Um, they have uh, investigators that go out. Colonel Williams, remember him? Well, it was uh, the Sykes, or whatever his name was, was, the, was from the Behavioral Sciences Unit that questioned them. They read the report and they sent back, because I saw this at the Kaufman Inquiry. I didn't get it. But you see, now the police have to give defense everything. Anything to do with Truscott, they had to get it. They got this. They got my report and they got this from the Behavioral Sciences Unit. Establish that there's a connection between Larry Talbot, three named victims that I gave you, 
Lynn Harper or others. Lynn Harper, OPP, Behavioral Sciences Unit said that. OPP, Behavioral Sciences Unit. Lynn Harper. See what you can do with it. Well, what did they do? 30 months after they got my report. 30 months, almost three years. Two police officers went to Talbot's residence, sat in the kitchen with his wife present, and asked him 13 questions. Took him less than an hour. 13 questions. You ever been to the Clinton Air Force Base? Never. Did you take a polygraph? Yeah, I got nothing to hide. Did you kill Lynn Harper? No. That was it. Nothing else was done. Nothing. That was it. Gone. Done. Okay. Now, I want you to have a look at this. Take, take a few minutes and look at it. To compare the analysis between those two crimes. This, as I said, was the cornerstone of my book. Cornerstone of the investigation. Got the other right, Harper on the left. I think it was 17. That was a lot longer. Pretty close. Let me tell you that chap I know that's a judge. Was the defense counsel for years. He read my book and he said, that's too much to be a coincidence. Too similar. Much too similar. Why do we say that? Where's the argument? Holmes and Holmes again. Holmes and Holmes again. So it is with the criminal personality. It has taken years to become the person he now is. He will not, over a short period, radically change. It's not simply a matter of not wanting to change. He's not able to change. This assumption has fundamental importance to the profiling process. The inability to change will result in the perpetrator committing a similar crime in a similar fashion. Similar crime in a similar fashion. Not only will the criminal commit the same crime, but he may force the victim to act out a scenario that he has forced previous victims to perform. Why? Because that fulfills his fantasy. His fantasy, those dark hours when he's thinking about this stuff. This is what he wants them to do. Lift your gown. Right? This is what he wants them to do. Okay? Okay, um, Stephen Truscott got $6.5 million, but money doesn't cut it with this. He had 10 years in jail. They had a ruined life. God bless them. They're doing fine now. It took them 40 years to clear, this, clear themselves. And when he was exonerated, I read in the National Post, Julian Fantino was the commissioner of the, of the day, and they interviewed him, and he said, uh, we'll do whatever we can, but it's a 40-year uh, uh, Investigation very cold, cold, and all those men that were involved in that they were commendable. They did it. They were good people. They were good men. Nothing was done. Nothing. They had no report. No argument there. I don't know. That he went down and said, "Do we have any suspects? Do we have anybody else?" I don't know. They didn't tell me. They didn't keep me in the loop for sure. Oh, very good question from Pat. <laughs> That's the other thing about apologies. Um, actually, it was interesting. The chief of police, apparently Saunders, apologized for the the, uh, the, the bathroom raids of 40 years ago. Just apologized now. I got thinking about it in terms of trust God. They never apologized. Oh, the attorney general did. Trust God didn't buy it. Because they did everything trying to keep this down, that, that, that he didn't get exonerated, nothing. The appeal court finally, you know, released him, but the OPP never apologized, never said anything. You know, folks, when you
when you when you when you do something and, and, and you make a mistake, what's the biggie here? The healthy organization or the healthy individual is going to say, you know, maybe we got the wrong guy. It was blatant. I mean, the United Church without picketing, Pierre Burton. It was a novel thing. I mean, Murder City. A friend of mine, uh, Mike Ironfield, has written a book called Murder City. Anybody read it? It's a wonderful, wonderful document. The Seaman Trust got the hangover. The Trust got hangover after it. Because of all the criticism they got, then ironically it became, oh, let's slow up on these. And after a while, let's slow up. I mean, you know, where do you start? But this is what went on. This is what went on. Now, after the acquittal, Tracy Tyler, who's now dead, wrote an article, and I was in it in terms of my guy and basically what I told you. Okay? Well, very tall and red, obviously. So, uh, Pat, I think you're up here. Yeah. Um, back in about 2000, no, well, it was 2008, I got a phone call, a phone call, and I answered, and there was nothing on the other end of the line, and then a hang up. So, but I hit star 69 to see who called and I got the number and I called that number and it was a man a raspy older voice and I said did you just call here did you just call a, a number in 519 area code and he went oh oh and hung up with so then two days later I get another call from Barry's not home and he said uh, are you the girl from 30 years ago in bingo, I knew who it was. And I said, who is this? And he said, never mind who I am, I was a girl from 30 years ago. And I said, again, I'll ask you, who are you? And he said, if you're the girl from 30 years ago, I'd like to say I'm sorry, but I have nothing good to say about your husband. And I said, well, He's not home right now. He's out at the gym, but he'll be home by 5 o'clock at the latest. If you'd like to call back, you can tell him yourself. So he said, okay, I'll try and get back to you. And I hung up, he hung up, and then I called the gym and said, you're not going to leave. We just, I was just talking to him. Anyway, Barry came right home. <laughs> And you know, after after we finish the lecture, if anybody's got any questions for Pat in terms of the victimization, uh, please ask her. She's very comfortable around it, and she has mentioned that that in the past people don't kind of. And she was really key to this whole thing. So if there's any thoughts or feelings or things you want to know about, she's very comfortable with it. Okay. I called the OPP, and uh, they had Chief Inspector, I'm sorry, uh, Detective Inspector Chris Gilpin come out, and she was wonderful. She came out with a couple of officers. They interviewed us, they did a lot of things, and she went and reinvestigated these cases. Went over them all. And uh, I was very comfortable with it, and then she said, you know what, we should, we should call him. You should call him, we should tape it. See if you can get something from him, in terms of trust guy or any of the others. So I was all for it, I said, sure, let's do it. And uh, they find out that I'd be called an agent of the police. So I couldn't do that. But I could write down what he said, and they could listen in as well, write it down. So now I want to share with you our conversation that I had with Larry Talbot after 35 or whatever years it was. And tell me what you think of this guy. The uh, behavioral sciences unit I told you about, he instructed me, he said, don't be critical, don't be judgmental, now you're friends. You know, it's all forgotten, forget about it. Let's go up and have a coffee, let's talk, this kind of thing. You get down, you're going to shut them down. Accusatory, you're going to shut them down. Don't do that. So, here's my conversation as I wrote it down. Pretty, pretty close to what it was. Hello? Is that you, Larry? It's Barry Rule. He's in a home. He's in intelligent care. He's dying. COPD. Hi. What are you doing in the hospital? COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, too much smoking, which I knew. I called your place because I wanted to apologize to the woman if she was the same one from 1970. Yeah, she is. 
She's okay, but you're a cop. I laughed. Pat tells me you had something bad to say about me. I'm upset at an article in the paper that didn't mention my name, but mentioned a traveling salesman for the 1957 Chev frequent in the Clinton Air Force Base on business. I've never been on that base in my life. Why did you write that? What, are you a cop? So we both laughed. Maybe not a little bit. Yeah, Truscott, he, or uh, uh, Talbot. Yeah, I read other articles you wrote. I feel sorry for Truscott. Had a tea party sitting around the kitchen with my wife and a couple of police women talking to me about Lynn Harper. They, they asked me a few questions like, have you been to Clinton? Oh, I found out where you live from a friend who looked you up, in, uh, up from a friend on the internet. Yeah, and what I did was a childish prank. What he did was, was a childish prank. Childish prank. Now here's where I'm trying to con. All forgiven, but you sure packed a mean wallet and shot me. Probably didn't go in too far. You gave me a couple of good shots as well. Then he laughed. Yeah, I was thinking of what I wore that night. Could have improved on that. Sociopath. No feelings. No, no story, really. Why did he call Pat? Why did he call? Why do you think he called? Let's see if we got any somewhat honored to the else? Relive. Relive? in control right to the end. He wanted to call. Now he was in control. He was still playing the game. He's holding the gun. He had us on the phone. And I swear, I, I'm almost certain he probably drove by our place and so happened. I, I'm almost certain. Never, I could never prove it. But I got to tell you, had he done that, it would have been like King Edward Drive. It's off the beach. <laughs> That's not the right answer. <laughs> you definitely don't get a book. Thank you. So here's here's what happened. Um, Gilpin tried her best. She said, uh, "I want to have a meeting with you." So I couldn't.